Humans have long been fascinated with what exactly it is that makes up the world we live in. Today we know that atoms are the fundamental building blocks of matter, but this was not always the case. It took humankind many thousands of years to accept atomic theory as an explanation of how the elements in nature fit together. Almost 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosophers Leucippus and his student Democrates first proposed that objects were made up of many indivisible particles of various shapes and sizes that they called atoma, from the Greek word for uncuttable. Around 360 BC, Plato gave mathematical shapes to the four roots or basic elements, earth, fire, air and water that the Greeks believed made up all the universe. And in 350 BC, Aristotle added a fifth element that he called quintessence. He thought that this was the element of the heavens. However, he rejected the theory of atomism put forward by Democrates. After the fall of the Greek and Roman empires, scientific thinking was suddenly seen as magic, causing science in Europe to stagnate throughout much of the Dark and Middle Ages. It would take a full 1,600 years before scientists like René Descartes and Sir Isaac Newton would once again put forward the theory of a universe made up of small particles or atoms hooked or glued together. The 1700s was a very exciting time for science. Amid great political and religious upheaval, it seemed that humans were ready to look at the world in a new way. Many new discoveries were made and investigated. In particular, the discovery of electricity propelled science forward. In this modern time, uh, the 21st century, we tend to take for granted a great deal of the technology that we are faced with today. The battery, of course, is now 200 years old and was discovered, um, it is said, by a fellow by the name of Aloisio Galvani, an Italian. Galvani was, in fact, um, lecturing to some of his pupils. He was a lecturer in medicine. Mrs. Galvani was standing in the one end of the room and she was preparing the evening meal because this was done at his home. And Mrs. Galvani was busy attentively listening to her husband but also skinning the frog's legs. She noticed that when she touched the frog's legs a twitch occurred. She called her husband over and said have a look at this interesting phenomenon. And Aloisio Galvani came along, looked at the frog's leg, saw the twitch and said, Ah, oh, wife, what a magnificent discovery I've made. Luigi Galvani wrote a letter to his friend, Alessandro Volta. Volta was not a physician. He was what we would today call a physicist, or in those days they were known as natural philosophers. And what Volta did was decided to set up the experiment as Galvani had done and realized very quickly that what had been discovered was not the essence of life, but some form of energy. And of course, this was electrical energy. Now, you see, the people of the day were not completely unaware of electricity. Electricity was known in the 1700s in the form of static electricity. Canaeus at Leiden University in Holland had done various experiments and in fact came up with a device known as the Leiden jar. The only device that was known at the time for the storage of electricity. The problem with this is it was static electricity. The experiments are always very brief in nature because of the sp short uh, duration of the spark. The voltage is always high, so some of the experiments are a little painful and there's not much else you can do with it. These two Italians, they came along and they found that by the use of certain dissimilar metals and chemicals, you could generate electrical power on demand, at will. This opened up a whole new vista for research um, within the field of technology and science. The Royal Institution in England had very quickly in the early 1800s devised a very large bank of batteries. In fact, the batteries consisted of 2,000 cells. If these cells produced each about 0.7 of a volt, you can imagine even 2,000 of those connected in series would have given quite a large amount of electric current. Michael Faraday started experimenting with this new form of energy. And it wasn't long, as one can imagine, 
before all sorts of discoveries were made. Oersted realized very quickly that um, if an electric current was passed through a wire, that a magnetic field could be generated. Michael Faraday realized that if you took one piece of wire and you laid it parallel with another, passing current through one of the wires, induced by not physical connection, but by electromagnetic connection, induced a voltage in the wire lying parallel to the first one. Time progressed into the mid-1800s, telegraphy has been discovered. Uh, Samuel Morse has uh, devised the Morse code. They started with uh, telephony, the telephone, sending voice across um, wires. By the 1890s, things really started to hot up. In those times, guys like William Crookes, um, various other uh, experimenters, all started playing with this new phenomenon of high voltage using a device called a Rumkov coil and passing this high voltage through tubes that the air had been exhausted from. So in other words, they had removed the air from these tubes and they tried to see what would happen if very high voltages were passed through the slot. Now, there is our cathode ray. You can see the ray appearing across the tube. This is the sort of thing that fascinated the scientists of those days. Now, this is very interesting because this led to all sorts of things. And of course, if you continue to experiment as they were doing, what would happen? Discoveries are bound to be made. And this, of course, led not only to the discovery of the electron, but also the discovery of something that I'm sure a lot of us have had dealings with in one way or another, the discovery of X-rays. X-rays were discovered by Willem Conrad Röntgen. He had photographic plates which were kept in a light tight container so that daylight could not get to these plates. These were kept in a drawer. For some reason, Röntgen actually decided to develop these plates after having played with his cathode ray tubes. Now remembering the light from the tubes had no way of getting to the photographic plates. Yet when he developed the plates they were exposed. There were markings on the plates that shouldn't have been there. He had then discovered what we today call x-rays. So by 1805 Dalton's theory that elements were made up of solid indivisible particles or atoms had been published and by 1897 J.J. Thompson, after experimenting with Crookes tubes, discovered the electron. At this time, Thompson's plum pudding model became the ultimate way to represent the atom, an unchangeable solid ball with electrons sticking out of its outer surface. Then, about 100 years ago, a group of scientists, without knowing it, shifted science and the world into a whole new age. The Frenchman Henri Becquerel, the son and grandson of prominent scientists, had heard of the mysterious X-rays being emitted by the phosphorescent walls of Crookes tubes that Röntgen had discovered. He decided to research whether all phosphorescent material emitted the same radiation. He used some uranium crystals that he inherited from his father for his investigations. During his research, he encountered an unexpected phenomenon. In his Nobel lecture, he describes his discovery as follows. I placed sheets of double sulfate of uranium and potassium on photographic plates enveloped in black paper and exposed them to the light for several hours. On developing the plate, I found that the uranium salt had emitted rays which produced the silhouette of the crystalline sheets through the black paper on the plate. Under these conditions, the phenomenon could be ascribed to a transformation of solar energy, like phosphorescence, but I soon recognized that the emission was independent of any familiar source of excitation, such as light, electricity or heat. We were thus faced with a spontaneous phenomenon of a new order. By chance, at just about this time, a brilliant young female scientist, Marie Curie, born Maria Slodowska in Poland, was looking for a topic to write a doctoral thesis on. She would later become the first woman in France to achieve a doctoral degree. 
she decided that the radiation phenomenon discovered by Henri Becquerel was just the subject that she'd been looking for, and because there'd been so little written on the subject, she would start experimenting and studying her own results almost immediately. Her first important discovery was that no matter which uranium compound she used, whether the substance was powdered, solid or heated, no variable changed the amount of radiation observed. Only when the amount of actual uranium atoms changed did the intensity of the radiation vary. This was significant because it meant that something must be happening inside the atom to cause this particular type of radiation. Remember, scientists still believe that atoms were created at the beginning of time and that they could never possibly change. So far, the only changes observed were when atoms reacted together to form compounds. She also found that a very uncommon element, thorium, emitted the same Becquerel rays as uranium and invented the term radioactivity to describe the radiation given off by these elements. As Curie worked through more uranium-containing compounds, she made yet another surprising discovery. She found that the mineral pitchblende, a uranium-rich ore, displayed such fierce radioactivity that it could not possibly be explained by the amount of uranium in the compound. She concluded that pitchblende must contain another element that was also radioactive and that had never been seen before. The prospect of isolating a brand new element was so exciting that her husband Pierre Curie dropped his own research to help Marie in her quest. In 1898, the Curies announced that they had discovered not one, but two new elements. Polonium, named after Marie's beloved Poland, and radium, the Latin word for ray because of its fierce radioactivity. The world hailed radioactivity as an even greater discovery than electricity, but little was understood of its potential dangers. In 1903, Marie and Pierre Curie shared the Nobel Prize for Physics with Henri Becquerel in recognition of the extraordinary services they rendered by their joint researches on the radiation phenomena discovered by Professor Henri Becquerel. In 1911, after the tragic death of her husband, Marie Curie received a second Nobel Prize, this time for chemistry in recognition of her services to the advancement of chemistry by the discovery of the elements radium and polonium, by the isolation of radium and the study of the nature of the compounds of this remarkable element. In the same year that Marie Curie received her second Nobel Prize, Ernest Rutherford did a series of experiments in which he bombarded a sheet of gold foil with positively charged particles. The positively charged particles he used were in fact part of the radioactive emissions of radioactive elements. What he found was that most of the particles passed through the foil undisturbed, suggesting that he was shooting them at mostly empty space and not in fact a solid sheet of gold atoms. Only a very small amount of the particles bounced back, suggesting that they came into contact with some immensely dense solid material. The conclusions that Rutherford drew from his research were revolutionary. It showed that atomic particles are made up mostly of empty space around a central core called a nucleus. And based on this work, Rutherford defined what we know today as the planetary model of the atom. In his long career, Rutherford laid the groundwork for scientists to understand the atomic structure. He discovered the proton and he also showed that the nuclei of all radioactive elements undergo a spontaneous and random process of decay over time. It is this decay that caused the radiation studied by Becquerel and the Curies. There are in nature more than 90 basic elements, which is science term for families of atoms. To scientists, the atoms of the individual atom families, or elements, are identified by number, that is, the number of protons, or positive charges, in their nucleus. And they vary all the way from hydrogen, which has just one proton, to oxygen, with eight protons, to gold, he's rich with 79, Finally, on to the heaviest of all natural elements, uranium with 92 protons. Now, within each element, 
or family of atoms, there can be different members, each one having the same number of protons, but differing in the number of neutrons. The total of an atom's protons and neutrons is its atomic weight. Thus, in natural uranium, we have U-234, U-235, and U-238. These different members of the same element or atom family, science calls isotopes. Some elements, tin for instance, have a great many isotopes. Others, like aluminum, are lone wolves with just one. Now, most atoms of most elements are content with their lot in life. We speak of them as being stable, but others are busy day and night, being what science calls radioactive. Like radium, throwing off powerful rays along with some of its neutrons and protons, until it actually alters its own nuclear structure and changes to another family, and then to another, until it does become stable at last. This spontaneous changing of elements is called natural transmutation. Of course, other great scientists like Chadwick, who discovered the neutron, and Francis Aston, who found naturally occurring isotopes for most elements, further informed our understanding of the atom, and in particular, radioactive decay. Okay, so what we know today is that uh, ordinary matter is composed of atoms. And these atoms are sort of mostly empty space with electrons that um, surround a, a small positive nucleus, um, which is composed of protons and neutrons. And so that's a lot of positive charge all stacked in one place. And um, you may wonder how it is that these protons stick to each other when they have this positive repulsion from each other. And the answer to that is the strong force, the nuclear force. And the nuclear force, which is felt um, and, and, and caused by nucleons, protons and neutrons, is what binds a nucleus together. We know of four forces, gravity, the strong force, the weak force and the electromagnetic force. Now the strong and the weak force are forces that only affect nuclear particles. Um, while the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force appear to um, have an inverse squared law, the strong force and the weak force do not. The, the structure of the strong force is that it's very, very strong at close range, but um, very quickly becomes weak and so in a nucleus, it's um, the fundamental um, force by far the strongest. But in, in, a, in a collision between two particles, even though they may be nuclei, the, the um, Coulomb repulsion is the, is the stronger force there because they remain relatively distant from one another. So you have a very complicated system in a nucleus in which there's repulsion and attraction. And different numbers of protons and neutrons interact differently together to create the huge range of isotopes and elements that we have today. First, I can explain what is a, a nucleus. A nucleus is made of nucleons, which are uh, protons and neutrons. The lightest nucleus is the hydrogen. It's one proton. And the heaviest one known on Earth, the stable one, is uranium. You heard about uranium-238. So it's 238 nucleons together. And in between, you have all the, the, the elements. Um, the stable nuclei are not radioactive. They are stable. And what we, we, we can find, we can have a look on the chart. So on, on uh, the x axis is the, the neutron number. On the uh, y axis is uh, the proton number. So on this line, the proton number, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, nuclei are isotopes, it means the same number of protons, and this line is the isotons, same number of neutrons. If you look at the black squares, they are stable. The red and the blue, they are uh, radioactive. It means they don't live, uh, they can live very long, but eventually they will decay to uh, the black squares and remain stable. The nuclei that are unstable um, will decay into a stable form. And the decay process uh, takes place by three common um, radiation processes. 
and the first is alpha decay, the second beta decay, and the third gamma. And these processes was, were named historically because they were the first three that were discovered. And uh, they were separated out from one another by using electric and magnetic fields. So we know today that alpha decay is decay by emitting a helium nucleus. In other words, a cluster of two protons and two neutrons comes out of a, a radioactive nucleus. This is a positive particle and it's very heavy. So in a magnetic field, it would bend one direction and it would bend only a small amount. The beta radiation, which is an electron, is, is much lighter and it's negative. So it would bend in the other direction and it would bend much more. So that we could already separate those two. The uh, gamma radiation is a process for a nucleus to emit energy without changing its species. So the general scenario is you have an unstable nucleus which decays and then it's left in an excited state and then it decays again by gamma radiation but remains the same species. The gamma radiation which is in fact just high energy light, um, very high energy light, it came out and wasn't affected by magnetic field, just came out straight and so um, early workers in radiation could distinguish between these three types of radiation. To calculate the products of a nuclear reaction or decay, we first start by revising the notation for an isotope of a fictional element X, which has A number of nucleons, protons and neutrons together, and Z number of protons. So if we have uranium-238 and it decays by an alpha particle, which we know is uh, a helium nucleus, then we can calculate what the missing element is. So uranium has 92 protons and helium has 2. That means that the other product must have 90. And if we look on the radioactive table of the nucleides, that's thorium. Then we can figure out which isotope of thorium it is. 238 minus 4 gives you 234. The discovery and study of radioactivity was undoubtedly the catalyst that led to the development of the technology that took us to the moon and beyond in the 21st century. But radiation is a two-edged sword. Ever since Marie Curie took mobile X-ray units to the front lines in World War I, its importance for medicine and medical research cannot be disputed. But Marie Curie died in 1934 of a plastic anemia a blood disease probably caused by long and uncontrolled exposure to radiation. Radioactivity's usefulness in the study of how our world came into being is invaluable, yet the very same knowledge can and has been used for destruction. Human curiosity led us to harness the incredible power contained within the atom, but humankind will have to accept the responsibility for the appropriate use of this very powerful tool.